Good morning and welcome to Timbro Church Faith University. My name is Tanisha Starks and I am honored to be your instructor on today. Let's open up in a brief word of prayer. Gracious Father, in the precious name of Jesus Christ, again, Lord, we come before you on this morning and we just say thank you. Thank you for this another day that you kept us and you brought us all together for uh, another powerful lesson Lord God, of the principles of your word, we pray, Lord, that you would have your way in this class, have your way in this lesson, that you would give me utterance. I pray even for all of those who would hear, God, that you would uh, open hearts to receive, open our understanding, Lord God, and Lord, that, that this word, oh God, will make a difference in somebody's life. It's in Jesus' precious name we do pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Um, today our lesson topic is witnesses to Christ's resurrection and our lesson text is coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 11 and I'm going to read it and you're hearing and the word of the Lord reads moreover brethren I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you which also ye have received and wherein ye stand by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas then of the twelve, after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are falling asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. Amen. Word of the Lord is blessed. Uh, today is a, a very important day a very special day in the Christian faith and the Christian church. Uh, this is a time where we, we in the body of Christ, we commemorate, uh, we celebrate uh, the, our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and so in our lesson today, we just want to uh, remind some and enlighten others that Christ's resurrection is not some fable, right? It's not some... Uh, fairy tale, but that his resurrection is an established historical fact. Uh, it actually happened. Um, and that there are many witnesses or testimonies that can attest uh, to Christ's resurrection. And so today in our lesson, uh, we will take a look at these testimonies and our outline will be as follows. We'll look at the testimony of the gospel. We'll look at the testimony of our witnesses and, um, we'll look at the testimony of Paul. And so Paul, uh, he's really, he's, he's writing this um, in the latter part of his letter to the Corinthian church. He, he's having to address this issue, this, this teaching, this uh, uh, doctrine of resurrection. He's having to address this because there were uh, false teachers who was impacting and infiltrating the, the Christian church, infiltrating the church at Corinth. And among many of the false teachings that uh, was going around, one of them was that of the resurrection. And that these false teachers were saying that there, there is no resurrection. And basically, you know, there's no, you know, no hope beyond the grave, basically. Right. And so Paul, he's having to uh, address this issue. And this is why he writes, um, uh, in a sense, trying to prove, you know, uh, the gospel, trying to prove or, uh, 
you know, show them or, or simply just remind this Christian church um, of the, the gospel that he preached to them. He's, he's reminding them that they initially accepted the gospel, right? They initially accepted it. And so this is why he really here, you know, is having a hard time uh, understanding uh, how they could be so soon swayed away from the truth. So Paul is telling the church to hold on uh, to the truth of the gospel. And the focal point of the gospel is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? Let's be clear. There is no gospel message. There is no salvation if Christ be not risen, right? Paul, he, he went on in, in uh, the latter part of uh, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, and he says, if Christ be not risen, then our faith is in vain. If Christ be not risen, then our preaching is in vain. And so one of the things that, that Paul, one of the ways that he preached uh, the gospel, he preached it in a very elementary way. And, and, and one of the reasons he, he may have done that was because uh, during the first century, many people were illiterate. And so the gospel was presented in such a way that they would, would understand it uh, and that they would remember it and be able to recite it. And so he preached, even in this text, he's reminding this church of the basics of the gospel. And, 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 and the essential basics of the gospel. This is the gospel uh, in its simplest form. We don't have to make this complicated. He's even showing us today. Because sometimes, even in our witness, we, we can be so complicated with our presentation of the gospel. But Paul here, he outlines the gospel in a very simple way. And it is simply this. This is the good news, right? He says, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Christ was buried according to the scriptures and Christ rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And one of the reasons why uh, Paul is emphasizing in his writing according to the scriptures is because he wants uh, this Corinthian church to understand that uh, the source of truth for their, for their belief of the gospel should never come from man uh, a man's own opinion or idea or man's intellect, but he's trying to uh, show them that your, our source of truth for the gospel message uh, is found in the scripture. And our source of truth should, should ultimately be the scripture. The, the final authority is the word of God. And so he's really making this uh, plain as he emphasizes here in his writing according uh, to the scripture. Uh, another thing that stands out is that at that time, at the time that Paul wrote this letter, when you think, of, as he says, according to the scripture, the only scripture that uh, they really had was that of the Old, Old Testament. So I believe that even when Paul preached, uh, he was so rehearsed in the, the law, he was so educated in the Old Testament that he was able to, even in his preaching, his presentation of the gospel, he was able to trace Jesus through Old Testament uh, prophecy. And so this is why he, you know, when he, pre when he preached and when he, uh, he really preached the gospel, when he preached the gospel, I'm sure, you know, you know, that he used Old Testament uh, scripture to further back his proclamation of the gospel. Okay. So uh, one of the th powerful things that Paul says, uh, we find this in Romans uh, 1, and verse 16, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Think about that. The gospel is the power of God to, uh, unto salvation to everyone who believes. So the reason why that one of the testimonies that Paul uses to back his case of the resurrection, he uses the gospel as a testimony itself. Why? Because the gospel itself has power to save. And he's, 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 he, what he's doing is he's building this case to remind this, the Corinthians church that, hey, why are y'all letting these false teachers cause you to second guess the gospel that you initially received, right? They initially heard the gospel that Paul preached to them in this basics form. They received it. They believed it. They stood on it, right? 
And he's showing them that even the gospel that you initially received, it had the power to save you. So this is why uh, he uses the gospel as a testimony uh, to the resurrection. The next uh, testimony that he uses is the testimony of eyewitnesses. Now, eyewitness, uh, eyewitness testimony uh, is a powerful line of evidence in any case. And Paul here in, in chapter 15, he's lining up the witnesses. So, you know, there'll be no misunderstanding uh, that, that they won't have to second guess their faith again. Because why? There are many witnesses that can attest to that they had a firsthand encounter, that they seen it with their own eyes, the risen Lord Jesus Christ, right? They, they, many of them watched maybe from afar off, but they watched and they seen, they seen Jesus hanging on the cross. They seen him go to Calvary. They, they, they seen, and they know that he was laid in an actual tomb, a physical tomb. And then they had the powerful witness, the powerful encounter of, of Jesus risen from the dead. And so Paul lines uh, this group of witnesses up to further prove that the resurrection of Jesus was an actual event that really happened. And it's true. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a fable. Right. And so he begins with the witness of uh, Cephas. He called, he called Cephas as, as a witness. And Cephas is pretty much is Peter. Uh, the scripture here, he uses Cephas because that's the Aramaic uh, form of Peter's name, uh, which is interpreted rock. So this is why he uses Peter. But let's let's talk about Peter for a minute, right? Peter was one of the, of the 12. He was a disciple of Jesus Christ. He, he walked closely uh, to Jesus Christ. And, and then at the time when Jesus needed him the most, we've, we've studied this in past uh, Faith University lessons where, where we learned that Peter denied Jesus. He denied him three times. He denied knowing him. Uh, and so we think about Peter as an eyewitness, right? Before Christ's resurrection, Peter was intimidated. He was scared to come forth as a witness. Why? Because he felt like his life was on the line. And, you know, maybe, you know, we talked about this. He probably didn't have the power to stand boldly then. But what happened? Peter became a, a eyewitness to Christ's resurrection. Right. And so even though Peter, uh, he denied Jesus. Guess what? When Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he, he showed himself. He made a personal appearance uh, to Peter and he restored Peter. He restored Peter. We can find that um, he, he made a personal appearance according to Luke 24 and 34 and Mark 16 and 17. Uh, we can find the restoration of Peter by the risen Lord Jesus Christ in John 21, 15 through 19. Uh, Paul then states that the risen Lord appeared to the other disciples as well. So all of the disciples, with the exception of Judas, because we know that Judas uh, at this time, he, he, was, he was dead because he, he felt so bad in betraying the Lord Jesus Christ that he hung himself. So he was no longer in the, uh, amongst uh, the, the, the 12 at this time. But, but Paul goes on and he says, hey, even the other disciples have said, you know, they gave personal testimony. They wrote about it, some of them, you know, that Jesus did, in fact, uh, rise from the grave. And so they all had the personal testimony that they seen Jesus in his post-resurrected uh, body. None of them had to go by anybody else's testimony. This is the power of eyewitness. We, we now, we're going by the testimony of, of others. Paul then goes on and he states that the risen Lord Jesus was seen or appeared to above 500 brethren all at the same time, right? 500 people who could corroborate with Paul's testimony of, of the resurrection. 500 additional people who corroborate, who can corroborate with the testimony of, of Peter and the other disciples, the original disciples that Jesus called. You have all of these 
witnesses, eyewitnesses who can attest and who did attest that yes, Jesus Christ really did rise on the third day. And no, I can't, you know, I, I have to put emphasis on this is not a fairy tale. It may sound like a fairy tale. Let's think about this. To say that Christ couldn't raise himself from the dead is to say that God can't, can't be God, right? Because God can do anything. When we look at it from that perspective, first of all, because sometimes in our own intellect and in our own thinking, uh, we can kind of put a limit on what we can't perceive. And man, the natural mind can't perceive somebody rising from the dead. The natural mind can't perceive somebody raising themselves back to life. We know that when people die, that's it. They're gone, right? But to say that Christ was not risen is to basically say that God is not God. And we know that Christ is God. <laughs> I'm getting excited here. This is a teaching lesson, but we're moving. So Paul, he, he says, hey, 500 additional brethren, they seen the risen Lord Jesus. And, and we know that um, we, we've never heard, you know, as we've studied the Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, as we studied that, they don't specifically identify these 500 additional people. They never even mention their names, but uh, this was most likely this account of the 500 plus seeing the risen Lord. This was most likely... Uh, this most likely happened just preceding Christ's ascension into heaven, according to Mark 16 and 15, verse 19, according to Luke 24, 50 and 51, and according to Acts 1, 2 through 11. You can read that in your spare time. But this is probably the most likely time when these 500 plus saw the risen Lord Jesus just before uh, he ascended into heaven. And so... Here we have Paul, he's really building the case uh, to defend the resurrection. And he's using this overwhelmingly uh, lineup of, 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 of witnesses, eyewitnesses and, uh, who have testimonies that can corroborate uh, or that can attest to the fact, the historical fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, the next eyewitness that Paul mentions is James. He mentions James as an eyewitness. And this James here, he's likely uh, the brother of Jesus, his, his blood brother, uh, who, who was not initially a follower of Jesus. He didn't even believe Jesus, right? Uh, he didn't believe that this is the same James who, who ridiculed and mocked Jesus for proclaiming that he was the son of God. He was embarrassed. That his brother, who he grew up with, who he sat and ate with, who he played with, who he learned with, even learned Old Testament scriptures with, his brother was proclaiming to be the son of God. His um James, this James, he didn't believe. He wasn't an original follower. So it's interesting that Paul would even use him as an example because guess what? He didn't believe initially, right? And so what changed for James? How did he become an eyewitness? The Lord made a special appearance to James after his resurrection, post-resurrection. And so that caused James to then believe. Can you think about that? And many of us, you know, we can pause here for a minute and uh, we can think about even our families. Sometimes uh, it's hard for the people who grew up with you, those who are familiar with you. And sometimes it's hard for our family to, to see um, uh, what God is really doing in our lives. Sometimes it's hard it's, it's the hardest for those who know you uh, to see you who God has called you to be in the spirit. And this is was this was the situation or the scenario with um, uh, Jesus and his brother, his brother, James. We can all we all had that experience. Right. Some of the hardest people to win to Christ uh, is, is your family, because while your family know you, they've seen you in all seasons. They have seen you trip. They seen you slip. They seen you, you, you know what I'm saying? So they know you after the flesh. It's hard for them to see you after the spirit. And so Paul uses James as an eyewitness, right? To the fact that Jesus did uh, rise again. He rose on the third day. After that, 
uh, he was seen of James, the Bible says, Paul says, after that he was seen of James, then he was seen of all the apostles. Now, we know uh, typically uh, that the word apostle is reserved for one of the 12, the original 12 that, that God called with him to do ministry. But in this instance, it refers to a group that was larger than the 12. So there were more apostles than just the original 12 that God called. Uh, their names are not mentioned in the text, but they would have been known in the early church. We do know of one of them because remember when Judas hanged himself, remember the, the apostles had to choose someone else to replace Jesus. And remember that M Matthias, he was the one who replaced Jesus. So Matthias probably came from that other larger group uh, of apostles outside of the original 12. And Paul lists them as well as a, um, a testimony, eyewitness testimony. Any of these sources uh, could have refuted Paul's, Paul's story, but they did not. The fact of the resurrection still stands today. The claim Paul is making did not originate with him, however. They were already established teachings of the church, in effect, even before Paul's conversion. Because remember, uh, Paul was not an original disciple. Paul, in fact, was an enemy, right? We, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get to that really quickly. But basically, Paul is he's given the testimony of these eyewitnesses that was probably somehow, some way, was passed on even to him. Okay. I want to note here, I want to pause and note here because I think it's, it's, it's important to note this, that we know from what we've read of the Gospels that the original eyewitnesses, let's, let's talk about it, right? The first eyewitnesses to Christ's resurrection were women, right? Remember the women, they were going to, to his tomb, you know, and, and, and they were the first ones to receive the message from the angels who was at the empty tomb that Christ was risen. The angels told them he's not here. He's risen. Go and tell all of his disciples that he is risen. So really women were the first eyewitnesses. They were the, the, the first ones, uh, who, who received the message that Christ was risen. But for, for, uh, cultural purposes or for cultural accommodation, Paul here, he mentions male, male disciples as the first Indisputable, indisputable witness. Note during the actual time of the events, the men did not accept the women's testimony without first going to the tomb to see for themselves. And we can find that according to Mark 16, 11, uh, Luke 24, 11 through 12, and John 20, 3 through 8. And the last and final testimony that Paul uses is his own testimony. It's the testimony of Paul. Uh, uh, according to verses 8 through 11 of our lesson text. Paul uses himself. Here, Paul refers to himself uh, in the most humble way, right? He, he, he says, hey, I'm not even worthy uh, to be called an apostle because I at one time was an enemy to the church and I persecuted the church, right? But he, he talks about his conversion. No doubt he's referring to in this passage of, of scripture, he's referring to uh, his invert, his conversion when he was on the road to Damascus. You can read that for yourself in Acts chapter 9. Um, Acts chapter 9, uh, verses 1 through 6. You can read that. Uh, specifically, verses 3 through 6. You can read that for yourself. That uh, Paul had a personal encounter with Christ. And guess what? Like James... Originally, he was not a believer of Christ, right? We just said that, right? And so not until he encountered, he had a personal en encounter. And the, the, the beautiful thing about Paul's encounter with Christ, right? Unlike the 12, the 12, they sat at the feet of Jesus. They walked closely with him even before, uh, you know, he went to Calvary. They learned from Jesus, right? But Paul, on the other hand, Paul had an encounter with Jesus after Jesus had finished the work on Calvary, after he had risen, and then after he ascended into heaven. So Jesus was already gone. He was off the scene, right? He ascended into heaven, and then he appeared after he ascended into heaven. Paul, oh my, he, what an experience that must have been on your way to, 
further persecute Christians and you want you run smack into Jesus himself, right? So Paul uses himself as an eyewitness testimony <laughs> to the risen Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Just, just so powerful. I'm excited about this lesson on today because this is the basis of our, our faith. This is the gospel that we preach, right? There's no gospel without uh, the resurrection. And so Paul he, he lists himself last and, you know, he says, I'm not even worthy. I'm not even fit to be called an apostle. But, but, but because of the grace of God, he says, because of the grace of God, I am what I am. You know, it's because of the grace of God that I am an apostle. And, and one thing I want to point out is that Paul, he was not taught the gospel by man. Nobody taught him the gospel. Nobody preached the gospel to him. Paul received the gospel by the revelation of Jesus Christ himself. And if you read in Galatians, you can read that for yourself on your own spare time. Galatians chapter one, Paul talks about that. He said, nobody taught me the gospel. Nobody preached the gospel to me. Jesus Christ himself gave me the gospel. And this is why he was able to go uh, uh, with such passion. He was able to, to go and to preach the gospel and with such passion, defend the gospel and with such passion, defend the resurrection and with such passion, uh, reaffirm uh, this Christian church who was now being shaken uh, by their faith because of false teachers. Paul, uh, he was qualified to be an apostle by Jesus Christ, right? By Jesus Christ. It was this encounter that, that changed the angry Saul uh, into uh, the loving evangelist, right? The loving apostle, uh, uh, the loving man who now, because of his encounter with Christ, because Christ had impacted his life personally, now he believed. And now he, he realized at his conversion that, hey, all this time I thought I was serving God and I wasn't. Woo! Thank God for grace. Let's just pause and just thank God for grace right there. Okay, we're moving. And so uh, it's, just, it's just powerful that uh, Paul basically, he points out... Uh, what what grace does in the in the life of a of a believer grace fosters humility and even as he pens this letter he's showing his humility by saying look i'm not even worthy you know um he shows us that uh another thing that grace does in the life of a believer is that grace fosters good works and he he says here let me let me just go here real quick he says um in verse 9 of our lesson text I'm sorry, verse 10 of our lesson text, he said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. So here, Paul, he's not boasting of his works that he's doing for Christ, but he's boasting in the grace of God. And that is the grace of God that's even driving him. He's not saying that I'm working for salvation, but he's saying I'm working because of salvation, because of what Christ uh, did in my life. And the, because of the grace of God, the grace that God bestowed on him. And, and, and just like Paul, uh, God bestows grace on us. Guess what? The thing about grace is it's unmerited favor. We can't we can't work to earn it. There's nothing we can do to deserve it. It's just it's just bestowed or gifted. Uh, to us. And so that's what Paul is saying. He's not boasting, uh, but he's saying it's the grace of God. And so um, powerful. So I, I want to wrap this lesson up because we're, we're running out of time. But why is one of the one out one of the things I, that come to my mind is why are witnesses important? Here's a question that comes to mind. In the Old Testament, our witness play an important part in authenticating truth. And so to convict someone of a crime, the law required at least two witnesses. Guess what? In the Old Testament, we needed two witnesses. But in, in the, to, to, to um, corroborate or uh, to reaffirm to us today that Jesus, in fact, rose from the grave, we have a host. As you can see, as we just studied in this lesson, we have a host of witnesses, eyewitnesses. That can attest that Jesus Christ, in fact, rose from the grave. And this is the gospel that we preach. And this is the basis of our salvation. If, if Christ be not risen, our faith is in vain. If Christ be not risen, 
uh, our preaching is in vain. All that we do is in vain, right? So I pray that uh, you were uh, blessed by this message, this lesson rather, on today uh, that Christ is risen. Um, we're just going to take this time now and then, uh, we're going to close out in a, in a word of prayer. Gracious Father, in the precious name of Jesus Christ, again, we thank you uh, for another opportunity that you've given us to come together and to, to study your word. Thank you for reassuring us even today uh, that our faith is not in vain, our salvation is not in vain, our, our preaching is not in vain, our teaching is not in vain. But we thank you, Lord God, for the work of of Calvary, and we thank you that our Lord and Savior Jesus has risen to give us life and that more abundantly. We pray now that you will bless each one uh, who partakes in this class and even those who will come back to, to watch the replay. Bless us all in a special way on this Resurrection Sunday. It's in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. That's our time for today. Thank you for uh, spending this time in the word of God with me. Join us again next week at Timbrel Church, Faith University. Be blessed.